the city council are present. Council member Schneider is not present. Can we please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the public for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, so we are gonna open up a public hearing and we have an informational item on the transition to district-based elections for council members. Who do we have doing this presentation for us tonight? So thank you, Mayor uh, Oliva. Um, good evening to you. Good evening to the city council and the community. My name is Tom Williams, city manager. Um, we have Mr. Paul Mitchell uh, from Redistricting Partners that will uh, be providing a presentation to the city council. This is the second required public hearing uh, to review the proposed district maps that's required under the California Voters' Rights Act. Uh, there's two that are required. Uh, we had one previously. This is now the second. Uh, public hearing. Um, real quick, uh, staff and myself, we've been out, a lot of community engagement. We are at a farmer's market on Saturday. And the good news is not one person that we have spoke to was surprised about this. Everyone had said, oh, we've received information in the mail. We're aware of it. And so I think our community engagement public outreach has been effective. And I'm happy to report it, it, at least people know about it. So I know we have a very tight schedule. So without any further ado, unless you have questions of me, I would like to introduce Mr. Paul Mitchell, um, uh, president of Redistricting Partners uh, for the uh, presentation this evening. Oh, I apologize. Uh, Mayor, we do have translation services uh, in Chinese and Spanish. So if uh, our city clerk would like to introduce. Introduce and let everybody know how to get on. Yes. Yes, so we do have uh, translation services in Mandarin and in Spanish. If our Mandarin translators can please let the uh, public know how to access translation services in Mandarin, please. 今晚我们提供普通话和西班牙语的同声传译服务，说明你可以找到点开极屏底部的口译地球仪的按钮，根据需要的翻译服务，在英语。汉语和西班牙语之间进行切换。我们要求任何需要口译服务的人，请说得慢一点，说得清楚一点，以便翻译能够有效地进行翻译。Thank you very much. Uh, can our Spanish translator please uh, notify the public how they can access Spanish services? Buenas tardes. En esta tarde tenemos servicios de interpretación simultánea disponible en el lenguaje de mandarín y el español. Puede localizar este, esta opción en el globo que se encuentra en la parte de abajo de su pantalla y puede, este, um, puede cambiar entre inglés a español o si gusta este mandarín al español e inglés dependiendo del servicio que desee. También le pedimos de por favor, si necesita servicios de interpretación, que por favor pueda hablar despacio, claro, para que el intérprete pueda hacer una traducción efectiva. Gracias. Thank you very much. I'll go ahead and I'll turn it over to Paul. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and I think it's great the kind of outreach you've been able to do and the kind of community engagement you've been able to achieve. Um, I haven't had the benefit of seeing it in person, but I do appreciate your social media. Um, and I like to see the, the way that you've been branding this and the way you've been communicating about with this has been really great. Um, I'm going to go through a quick presentation to show uh, kind of where we're at in this process and uh, start to get in the process of identifying some draft maps. I presume you can see my screen here. Um, so first off, uh, we, let me see. Um, in this process, we are going to be utilizing a number of traditional redistricting criteria in order to evaluate and look at potential draft maps. Now, uh, what I'm gonna be showing you first is a number of maps from the public and we're looking at these maps uh, based 
uh, on, you know, they are community input, but a lot of the process is figuring out how to take this community input and then translate it into fitting into all the requirements of the law. Um, districts have to, as an example, be relatively equal size. The idea is that in districts, you're going to have people who have relatively equal amount of representative power and relatively equal amount of voting power. And that idea of having districts that are within 10% of each other in terms of total population is an important basic principle of the redistricting process and districting for the first time as well. Districts need to be contiguous, which means that they need to be whole parts. Now in some agencies, uh, we're doing redistricting in some agencies that kind of like start and then there'll be like a, an area they called an island, uh, an area that's disconnected that's also part of the city and then another area that's disconnected that's part of the city far away. And so they have to be connected to the city in a way that's the most rational. So there are issues sometimes when you have agencies themselves that aren't contiguous. Um, but uh, for the most part, uh, in an agency like yours, we're really just talking about them being whole pieces. There's also a point that I'll bring up in a moment when we look at some of these draft maps, that the state law disallows a type of contiguity this is called point contiguity. You can imagine two census blocks that have just one little tiny part that touches, kind of like catty corner to each other. Um, districts can't be point con contiguous anymore. And so if we see that, we'll have to point it out and say like, we don't think that that would be contiguous even though technically somebody might say like mathematically it's contiguous, but for the purposes of redistricting, it's just not considered contiguous under the state law. Uh, districts should maintain communities of interest. Um, this can be a, uh, you know, really kind of big umbrella term. Uh, the state law defines it as uh, communities with socioeconomic or other characteristics. And essentially what you should be looking for in potential communities of interest to consider, it's kind of like our three, our three tests. Is it a community that you can define, like have a name or there's something that keeps it together? Is it, you know, downtown renters or cyclists or people who are uh, commuters? Uh, that could be a, a, a community that you could identify with some kind of like a name or an understanding of what it is. The second thing is, does it have a footprint? So when you're looking at this community, um, do all the cyclists have one area that they either live in or that they, they have their recreation? Is there an area where that community of interest really has a, a large number of its residents? Um, renters, you could look at census data on renter versus homeowner and identify areas where there's a more of a footprint of renters. Commuters, you could identify people who live in, cord in transportation corridors, um, or have people come up and publicly testify, like the people in my area are most concerned about this, this particular issue that has to do with us as commuters. So we're looking for identifiable group, that footprint. And the third thing is really a, uh, an important element, and that is what is the relationship back to the city of Millbrae? What is the connection to government? Because the idea of identifying these communities of interest is not just some academic thing, like wouldn't it be great for all the people who are into, you know, art house movies being in one district and all the people who are into the giants being in another district. It's really about taking people who have a need from their government. They either are trying to elect people to get some policy outcome, or they're trying to get their representative that they have in some kind of coordinated way to um, think or care about their issue and how do we draw them into districts effectively. So um, a renter and a group of renters might have actual policies that the city council is adopting that have to do with housing availability or rent control or, or other issues that have to do with uh, you know, them as renters. That's a different set of policy goals than maybe homeowners might have. People who are commuters might have a specific policy outcome. Even people who are cyclists might be calling the city council, opposing those sharrows um, in the road and wanting to have more coordinated bike lanes and a bike lane strategy. So you have the connection, that third piece, that connection back to local government as being an important part of what a community of interest is. 
We want to follow existing geographic boundaries. Now, for city council, we're really looking at neighborhoods as one of the key elements in a uh, a potential redistricting or districting process because that ends up becoming some of the building block of districts. And then finally, and I, I emphasize finally, uh, compactness is one of the lowest ranking criteria. Compactness in a lot of redistricting nationally is this whole exploration with tons of academics arguing about mathematical formulas to define the most compact shape. Um, in California, we have gone another direction with a new measure for compactness, which is more of a qualitative measure. And it looks at communities and it says, or population centers, and it says that a district is not compact if it, viol if it, uh, if it avoids nearby populations to get some other far away population. So if you have a bunch of nearby populations, you've got this way far away population and you were to draw a district that connected those two and bypassing a bunch of other nearby populations, that would be not compact. I will uh, admit that this has not been adjudicated. So we are trying to use this terminology to drive redistricting based on what, how we're interpreting it right now. But for the most part, the idea with compactness is you know, are we making districts that kind of rationally can be seen as, you know, nearby communities and populations with each other, not some kind of, you know, far away distant uh, areas. Now, part of our process hasn't been just to inform the public. It has also been to try to elicit feedback from the public. And one of the best kinds of feedback we can get nowadays, which honestly we couldn't get 10 years ago, at least not in this scale, is draft maps. And there's a program called Districtor that we're using with the city that allows people real easily to kind of color in maps. It's kind of fun, it's pretty easy. A lot of the community will enjoy using it. And, uh, and then drawing those maps and submitting them to the city. Um, through the th 23rd of January, we got 13 completed plans in. Uh, there were a few of them, five that didn't really meet the criteria to become a potential plan that you could adopt and say, hey, there's a plan we want to elevate that as a draft plan and consider it. Um, maybe with some changes they could, so we're not like completely dismissing these. We're just saying these aren't the ones that are compliant uh, with the current law. Uh, there are eight plans that are compliant and um, any of these could be elevated to become one of your new draft maps. Now, these, these maps that weren't compliant, I want to draw your eyes. It might be hard to see, but like, look at this purple district here on, uh, on this plan. You can see that it's two kind of disconnected parts, and it just kind of touches. That, we'd have to look at it really close to be sure, but that, it, you know, at this level, looks kind of like point contiguity. And I think the question there would be whether or not that that is an actual contiguous district. Um, the same thing here. In this district where you have this red area and it's kind of barely touching the rest of the area, that might not be contiguous there. And then up here, this yellow district might not be contiguous there. So um, the contiguity issue seemed to maybe capture uh, a few of these plans and become a problem. The other problem that we had with some of them is that they just weren't within that 10% range of uh, maximum deviation. Now, looking at the maps that were submitted that we're considering right now to be compliant and eligible um, to uh, elevate to become a draft plan for you. Um, one was actually submitted uh, prior to the 17th. Two plans are actually identical. Um, and then there's five others that are compliant with the Fair Maps Act when we looked at it. I, I'll read these numbers. They're five digit numbers uh, coming out of uh, Districter and they just crossed the 100,000 threshold for their plans. So they used to, actually, they used to be five digit numbers. Now they're six digit numbers. Uh, 101707 is a five district plan with a total plan deviation of 8.2. And this was used as a starting point of our draft map F, which you'll see. The, we made some changes so we can consider this as kind of being the DNA of that draft plan F. Uh, 102, 290, uh, this has a smaller deviation of 3.9. It does have, as an example, this district number two 
has a lot more little arms and smaller areas. It's not as much square-like or circle-like. Under those mathematical calculations in other states, this would probably be seen as less compact. But in terms of our work, you could look at it and really the council would be in a position to be able to determine whether or not the way that this district is laid out, whether it is functionally acting as a compact district because it's keeping nearby neighborhoods together or not. We had two plans, 102.925 and 103.217, which are exactly the same plans uh, with a 6.7% deviation. These plans uh, do have nice compact shapes. Um, and I think that at that point, you're looking at the relationship to the rest of the agency, the rest of the city. Uh, District 103.301 uh, totaled plan deviation of 6.9%. Again, we're gonna talk about this a lot, but you know, the compactness of a district like this district number one here, um, maybe the council looks at that and goes, aha, that really does capture this community that that uh, should have a shared uh, district. And maybe they'll say, no, it actually goes across like four different neighborhoods. It really doesn't make sense. So that's something to, to look at. Uh, 103.804, 7.9% uh, deviation. 103.808, a 5.5% deviation. I wanna note that when uh, we've had some staff look at these maps for the first time, they really were struck by how they ended up so many of them kind of looking like strips. But when we actually look at the city of Millbrae, that does seem to be kind of some of the relationship of the underlying neighborhoods. So um, it might be something that's a kind of a natural thing for this city where it might not in other cities seem, you know, in other cities you might see districts that are just like four boxes. Um, but uh, when you look at other cities, their neighborhoods might also look like four boxes rather than looking like, you know, communities that stretch across from uh, the 280 all the way across to um, El Camino uh, Real. Uh, this one district, 103, A13, 9.9% um, deviation. So kind of high on that end of a total 10% deviation, but I don't want you to feel like we're in a numbers game of like the smaller deviation is by its nature automatically preferred. A smaller deviation can be great, um, but it wouldn't be necessarily great to draw a plan that split more neighborhoods or created less, less uh, compactness in the districts um, or you know didn't meet other criteria simply so that you could get from a 9.0 to an 8.1 or even to a 1.1. 1 .1. um, that deviation number, really think about that as kind of a threshold. Is it under 10%? It is. Then it's presumed that it is uh, balanced. Uh, the draft maps that we have here for you to look at, draft map D based on a publicly hand-drawn plan, uh, E based on COI submissions, which is the community of interest submissions that we received, and F based on the district or, uh, map that I showed earlier. So uh, this draft map D was based on a hand-drawn plan. Uh, I wanna note that the original hand-drawn plan had a really large deviation. And this is a, a thing for us to think about. Um, when we get maps and they aren't perfect because they weren't drawn by a professional or whatever, and they have a big deviation or they don't have contiguous districts or whatever it is, that doesn't mean we can't learn from those public submissions. Um, uh, we can take from those public submissions and, and you know, try to understand what the uh, person was trying to do and try to uh, build from that. So this was the plan that we ended up building in that instance. Um, so this was the hand-drawn and that's the modified version. There we go. So this was what the hand-drawn plan looked like. And that was what we did to modify it, to balance it, to be within that 10% range. When we look at the uh, data table for this map, you can see that there is uh, two data tables here that we're looking at. Uh, since this is the first map, I'll talk about this map a little bit more uh, and what these data, table mean, data tables mean. The top data table is that decennial census, meaning how many people were living where on April 1st, 2020. So it is a what we call a point in time calculation. It is, uh, it is what is used to create 
that question, that balancing of districts. So we say, you know, you say, Paul, what's the total plan deviation of this district? We'll look at that top data set. The bottom data set is the citizen voting age population. That data actually comes from the census. So it's still census data, but not from that point in time survey. It's not from the April 1st, 2020, you know, wherever everybody was living on that day. It actually comes from a data set that came out in February of 2021. Um, it is supposed to be updated in 2022, but it hasn't, and it looks like it's going to be delayed. But it is an, a, a data set that gives you an average over a five-year period from surveys that were sent to residents, three and a half percent of all U.S. residents or all U.S. households every year. So it is a it is a calculation or an estimate that comes from the U.S. Census. Now the U.S. Census is required to in their in their work every year uh, by the Department of Justice put out this citizen voting age population calculation that can be used in a redistricting context. Um, and it shows us how Latino, Asian, or African American, or if we were, when we did redistricting in Alaska, we could get the same data for uh, uh, Alaskan natives. Um, so, uh, or American Indians when we do work in New Mexico. So depending on the area, there are other subcategories, but. For our purposes in California, traditionally, it's Latino, Asian, and African-American we're looking at. And you can see in each district what its breakdown is in terms of those metrics. So just to kind of go over it again, if you say, Paul, how big is this district? How many people does it has? My eyes will go to that top data set. If you say, Paul, how Latino is that district? My eyes are going to go to that bottom data set. And when we look at this first draft plan and we look at that top data set, we can see that it has a district one that's underpopulated by 3.7%, but it also has a district five that's overpopulated by 4.6%. So what's its plan deviation? Well, the plan deviation is the sum of those two, the sum of the absolute value of those two. So a total of 8.3 between those two ends of the spectrum, both literally in this case, because they're districts one and five, but generally just the highest and lowest number. Um, when we look at the data table below, I will draw your eyes to the Asian citizen voting age population numbers in these districts. And then you do have a district number two that is over 50% citizen voting age population Asian. Um, you have two others that are over 45% and one that's over 40%. Your lowest percentage is 37%. Now, um, we can call that district number two a majority minority Asian district. What we can't call it just kind of glibly is a Voting Rights Act district. We don't know, we don't have all the research to say that that is a required construction. We haven't worked with your attorneys and gone through any kind of section two Voting Rights Act analysis to determine any obligations you might have for how those districts are drawn and what percentages you might or might not need to hit. But so. For, the, for this process, we will keep an eye on that, those numbers, but we won't use those data points as a predominant factor in the redistricting process. Um, draft E, which was based on community of interest submissions, um, and this was essentially drawn by people identifying their communities, their neighborhoods, then figuring out how to piece those together in districts. Uh, um, very different than the old days when, you know, redistricting would be done just by some people in a closed back room. Now this means that you've actually taken community input at the most core level of where is your community live and who are they? And then you've tried to translate this into a redistricting plan or districting plan. So um, areas like Bill, Bayside, Mill Estates, Millbrae Highlands, Glenview Highlands, and Central Millbrae all kind of being identified as to what district they could be in or should be in, and then trying to figure out a way to draw them. And you'll notice that this plan has somewhat of that striping in, uh, in let me see real quick. Sorry, there it is, draft plan E. Um, when we look at draft plan E, you see that it has some of that striping, but it also has other relationships of those districts. When we look at uh, the total deviation, we're at 7.5% total plan deviation. Uh, draft plan F uh, was submitted as 
ID number 101707. Um, we didn't make any changes to this. And you can see there it is right there. Um, the total breakdown of this district and its total populations. Let me see real quick there. Okay, there we go. There it went to draft plan F. So there it is as the original and there it is as the draft plan F. Um, when we look at the total populations an 8.2% total plan deviation. So the largest to the smallest 8.2%. Um, and again, when we look at those uh, citizen voting age populations on this plan, we do have one district that's over 50% citizen voting age population. I didn't touch on that on E, but E as well had one district that was over 50% citizen voting age population. So with that, we've looked at a number of districts and the question essentially is what next? I First point I wanna make is in no way is the goal here to say, here's some maps, pick one off the shelf, just that's it, you're done. This really is supposed to be an iterative process. So we wanna hear from you and hear from the community about things they like or don't like about potential plans. Um, sometimes the community or council members will identify things they don't like about the plans that we really just can't do anything about. Um, you know, the population equality requirement um, the shapes of the census blocks themselves sometimes force certain things to look certain ways. Um, you know, the fact that we have to be in districts at all, those are some things that might not be within the bucket of things that we can snap our fingers and fix. But at the same time, we might hear some things from the public or council members that make us think about potential ways to make changes to these plans or uh, you know, introduce new plans, uh, particularly any new plans that the public draws and submits. So um, I don't want anybody to feel like this is a, um, you know, any kind of a take it or leave it proposition. This is really a, a way for us to build upon the work that's been done by the public and allow you to work to identify uh, the best plan that you can have to carry you through uh, the next decade. So identifying any preferred plans is great suggest any changes. And then finally, let's get that back out to the public and have the public give more additional input. And with that, I'll go ahead and close my slides and happy to take any questions. I think we're gonna uh, open it up to the public first, if that's okay. Public comment, council members, are you good with that? Yeah, we're good. We're good. Are you Perfect. Yeah, we're so good. Do we have any hand raised? We have a lot of participation here. Council Member Schneider, I'm going to wait for the public. I see your hand. Number up. 15, foot lettuce. Oh, oh you my God. Olivia, I want you to jump here, open, but I believe make it right. No, 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 no. Oh, my God. The big drip. I want that and I desire that. I need that. I'm dreaming about that, man. Give it here. We get everybody muted for no you fucking fucking bitch mayor mayor I, uh council sorry about that we uh We'll try to track down who that was, but uh, I think we're good now. Thank you. Council member, Council member Schneider, I'm going to hold off on our council members for a moment, and I'm going to go to Jean Wong with her hand up first. Jean, we have uh, three minutes. If you'd like to go ahead. I, I think she needs to be unmuted. She's unmuted. Okay. Th thank you very much. And um, thank you, Paul, for, for clarifying um, what has happened to date and all that information is very, very uh, helpful. I do have a question for you. Can you further clarify what the public's next step is. It's not clear to me that at this point we take the the, the seven or, or four, four uh, seven or six preferred maps that, that you you've posted, and we make suggestions 
to those or are we still at a point where we could still submit maps of our own? Thank you. Hi, did that not, did I not come through? I'm it sorry, was, can you- um, I'm sorry, Gene, uh, Gene, I, I did hear you. I think everybody heard you. And at this I, time, um, we'll take the question and answer it at the end of comments, if you don't mind. That's what I thought. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Nathan, Chan. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you, Nathan. Okay, great. Uh, thanks for having the opportunity to uh, speak on this. Um, I have a couple of uh, thoughts on the current, on uh, what it takes to create a fair map for uh, the communities of interest in Millbrae. Um, the first is that I think it's really important that the entirety of the city east of El Camino is kept together in one district. Um, they have a unique set of issues like annual flooding that this year turned quite deadly, uh, limited access uh, to and from the neighborhoods. And I've also heard uh, several community comments about how uh, parkland in their neighborhoods could use a lot more um, love and maintenance and attention. Um, unfortunately, uh, the entire uh, just we, it, the population of that area is not sufficient to be a district on its own. So I think the key trade-off is uh, what neighborhood west of El Camino is the best to group with them. Is it Millwood? Is it downtown? Or is it the area around El Camino and Millbrae Avenue? I think it's also really important to try to keep the multifamily areas of Millbrae together to go back to uh, what um, Paul Mitchell said about uh, the interests of renters. Um, and those are primarily along Richmond Drive, Broadway, and El Camino. I've tried to keep those together in the maps that I've drawn. And then the third criteria I think is important and that people have mentioned is uh, try to keep the neighborhoods as much together as possible. I think that um, there are three maps that uh, address these criteria in various ways. I think uh, draft map S from the consultants is one. I think the map that's uh, called Amy Lauer one, although I noticed on District R, the map looks different than in the packet uh, that's currently on the configured Millbury site and uh, the map 13301. I think these are all solid uh, maps to build upon um, in future iterations. And yes, I think that the uh, three type criteria I listed, I think should be foremost on the council's mind. Thank you very much for your time. Bear with us for just a minute. Um, I don't know if we've lost the mayor. Give us a, a few minutes. I'm here. I just couldn't unmute. Oh, How about if we sorry. do this? Eduardo, can you yes. just uh, unmute going down the line? Because it's taking too long for me to unmute when you're muting everybody. Will that work? Okay, yeah, I can ask them to unmute. I, I think they would need to do it, but I, I can definitely do that. Every time that I try to unmute, it says host is not allowing. Okay. So how about how about um, if you have control, why don't you take control of going down the public, the public uh, line so we can make better value of this time?
Jay Caruso. Yes, uh, good evening. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, I'd like to give you a quick background with respect to me. Um, we moved to Millbrae 50 years ago. Uh, I attended Millbrae School, Taylor, uh, Mills High School, participated in uh, the Lions Club Little League, Millbrae AYSO, and a uh, member of St. Dunstan's Parish. And the reason why I mention all of that is to mention that, um, you know, we've been here since I was four years old, and I've um, walked the streets and, and know all of these neighborhoods and have, have uh, really experienced a lot of it. And I've, you know, certainly appreciate uh, everything that Millbrae has to offer. Um, I did then and I do now. And my, my concern with respect to this is, is kind of twofold. One, you know, I submitted a map that I think met all the criteria, but it, for some reason it didn't show up as the accepted ones tonight. Um, so I'm not really entirely sure how we decided which maps were included and which were not. Um, but on top of that, the, the idea of strips in the underlying neighborhood is of great concern to me because it really does not, um, having these strips does not account for the, the whole idea of maintaining a community of interest. Uh, you know, the, the, with respect to the communities of interest, so much of it is, or as you mentioned, around recreation, is around um, whether or not there's single family housing or it's multifamily housing, or, um, you know, talking about the existing geography. So there's, there's a quite a different set of interests and needs for, you know, those who live in Upper, Tele, Upper Telescope Hill than those that are living down on Richmond Drive and um, different, different, uh, you know, just such different experiences based on on the geography, based on the neighborhoods, based on when the time the, when the homes in that area were built, based on traffic patterns, uh, uh, you know, based on crime, based on all these different things. And so I think by going to those strip type maps. We're really getting away from that. You've got people with totally different, um, you know, priorities and criteria in, in a number of these maps lumped into the same district. So, you know, my thought would be to really get out, walk the neighborhoods, look at the geography, you know, and, and look at what's important to those that live in each area instead of, uh, you know, again, those strip portions that really don't account for any of that. Thank you so much. Prudence. Lou, can you unmute? Lou, are you able to, uh, to unmute? There, I see you're Thank you. I do not believe that anyone really thinks we have a voter representation problem or need voter districts. Fact is, we had an opportunity some time ago that we missed an opportunity to avoid the districts and the CVRA. For almost three months, I had asked council and city manager to explain why we did not exploit that opportunity. None of you or the city manager have disagreed with me that we had the opportunity. Yet none of you have answered my several requests during the three months to explain why we did not, did not take advantage of the opportunity. So I ask again, why didn't we? The city manager was responsible for not acting on the opportunity. So Mayor Oliva, Mayor Oliva, I ask you to ask him to explain to you and all the other voters why he did not act. I guess you'll have to do that at the end. And the ending part, I have two questions. Ask the city manager to explain why he did not use the opportunity and ask if you disagree, anybody disagrees with me that we had the opportunity. 
I like answers to those questions. And for the voters and, and our citizens, I have worked in public service for over 40 years, including senior man management positions in San Francisco, San Jose, and 12 years here in Millbrae. And I can tell you without reservation that without, without some reasonable explanation as to why we did not take advantage of the opportunity, this is one of the most irresponsible things I have seen in those 40 years. So again, if you're not gonna do it during my three minutes, you've indicated you'll answer questions at the end of the comments. Again, my questions are, why did we not take advantage of those opportunity, the opportunity we had to in high probability avoid the CBRA and avoid districts? Why did we not take that opportunity explained by the city manager or perhaps someone on the council? And do you disagree that we had the opportunity to do that? And if you disagree, we did not have the opportunity. Well, explain to me why we didn't have the opportunity because there was an opportunity to negotiate with interested parties well before the CVRA come, come, came to our doorstep. So those are two things I asked you to tell us at the end of the comments. Thank you for your attention. Um, the only other hand I see is um, Joe Terezi. Joe Terezi, Joe, are you able to? to uh, unmute yourself. I think we're having some technical difficulty, difficulties. Um, oh. Have a few minutes. Thank you. There we go. How's, how's that? Can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah, Joe, we can hear you. Great, thank you. Okay, um, yeah, I, uh, I submitted a map and unfortunately mine was one of the maps that got disqualified and I understand why technically, I guess it was not contiguous because of that hole, you know, that's, that's the, the area of, of San Bruno that is, is Cappuccino High School. But uh, I thought I had done a, a pretty good job of um, maintaining the integrity of the various neighborhoods throughout the city. And another thing that was, I thought was somewhat unique about my map was that I, I linked the rental areas along Richmond Drive with the, with the neighborhoods on the east of El Camino, thinking that um, those areas have um, the fact that it's, it's likely that, that, that many of those folks are, are renters, they have that, that in common. Uh, my question is, um, is there any way to, to slightly break up some of those census blocks? Because I think if, if we could break up that huge census block that's centered around Green Hill Country Club, that there would be a way uh, to, to make my map acceptable by making the, the two areas that are not now contiguous, contiguous, if I could just take a little bit of that, that Green Hills Country Club census block and, and use it to unite my two areas uh, I think it, it would meet that criteria and would allow for another option that I believe um, 
maintains the integrity of more neighborhoods than, than some of the other examples do. So thank you. The only other person with the hand up I see is Council Member Schneider. I, I think I was able to unmute now. If you, Eduardo, if you'd like me to take over, okay, you're helping out there. Looks like we got a little Zoom bomb and took over our meeting. There. Hi, I'm Taylor. I'm 24 years old now. So with that being said, there's no more public comment. Um, I I would I think there was a couple of questions. Can we address the questions of the public? Or Paul Paul? Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you have answers to a couple of those questions? Yeah. So um, maybe you'll refresh me on some that uh, that I'm not recalling off the top of my head. But definitely one of the first questions that was asked was about whether or not there's still time to submit maps using the online system. And absolutely, um, I think that receiving that public comment through the mapping software is something that we'll continue to do throughout the process. Um, and. <laughs> It could be valuable to uh, to consider any maps that we are looking at and the construction that's look, being looked at by the council and try to figure out a way to, you know, make recommendations. Um, the way my brain works, I remember the first question. I remember the last question about census blocks. So I'll answer that real quickly. I think um, Jean's Jean's question was, "What do we do now?" now that the we manage that mute button as much as we can, I think, uh, for the for the rest of this meeting. But the um, uh, the steps now are to consider the maps that are up as drafts, because those have been put before the public as potential draft maps for you to consider. You can think about this as potentially like a funnel where you're trying to cull down the number of maps you're looking at to really allow the focus of the public to be on one map that really has oh, so to be a draft map. <laughs> that Zoom bomb is weird because it's taking over legitimate people's actual yeah. call-in numbers. So to, um, for, the, for the public, this is not ours. This is not us. This technology came from a bomber. So hang in there, guys. Everybody, this is important stuff. Let's ju let's do the best we can here. So. Um, the uh, sorry to get off my train of thought on that, but the um, the you can think about this as funneling down to like one or two maps you're really considering, because while the public might want to see 13 or 20 or 100 maps, the reality is that their ability to give really productive input onto a map that's potentially going to be your map for the next 10 years. It really helps for them to understand that maybe one or two maps are really the focus of the work. Um, and then also looking at revisions, um, any revisions of maps or things that you want to look at trying to achieve. And we can uh, express those here in these meetings. Um, you could go back and have them at the next meeting as a as recommended changes by, you know, after you spent some more time looking at them. But we really do want to hone in on on, you know, essentially getting to a point where we'll ultimately have a final meeting. In best case scenario, we will have moved to that final meeting one single map. And then that one single map will be uh, uh, up for an up or down vote by the full city council as a potential final draft. So that maximizes the amount of public uh, awareness of what's happening to have that process and always ensure that every map that's potentially being considered is... Um, is public for seven days before you have your meeting. The uh, other thing that obviously we're gonna have to do is that uh, right now our districts, uh, we're gonna wanna make sure that if we're, depending on what iteration we're doing, that we're assigning a district number and the election cycle to these, to these districts in a way that is rational. Um, there are a couple things that have been used in this, that are in the state law that have to do with how you should number districts. Um, one is really looking to any community-based organizations, or in this case, even people who might be bringing forward any kind of a claim and uh, eliciting from them feedback on preference for how you want to number districts. Uh, it might sound like numbering districts is pretty simple, 
but there are elements of, let's say a community has never elected somebody to the city council. They might say, aha, we really want this new district down here to be up for the election in 2022. So as soon as possible, we can elect the first person to the city council from this area. I'm not saying that that's the case, but there are instances of that being a rationale for how you number districts and assign those to election years. The other option might be that somebody says, you know, aha, we've got this great area here. We're drawing this to maximize the ability for say renters to have input on the election. But we know that renters are generally lower turnout than homeowners in elections. And so maybe that renter group, that community organization, um, or maybe one of the advocacy organizations that's local will come forward and say, for the purposes of this district, we really think it should be in a presidential election cycle because in a presidential election cycle, we know our voters are gonna be higher turnout. So that is one additional thing that's kind of on your plate as we go into that, uh, as we progress towards uh, getting to a final map and the final numbering and so on. The one other technical question that was asked there at the end had to do with census blocks. We've talked about this before that census blocks, think of them as like honeycombs. And the smallest unit of geography in the census data is the block. It can have zero people, it can have thousands of people, but generally it's you know, maybe it'll be five, 17, 25 people, but it's these little tiny blocks that you build together, to create your districts. In this case, you do have one area that are a couple places where you have really big blocks. And when you're drawing districts and you're moving around and you click that block, all of a sudden you get a bunch of stuff that you didn't want. Or as was mentioned by Joe, the speaker, uh, the last speaker, I believe, uh, you select that block and all of a sudden it stops you from being able to draw a district in the way you want because it's just such a huge flock. Um, the reality is that we can, from a GIS level, we have the expertise to be able to split those blocks, but from a redistricting perspective, it's a best practice to work within the entire block system because that's where the data comes in. And once you do split a block, then you're kind of guessing as to the total population of each district. So um, generally in redistricting, we won't split blocks in a citywide redistricting unless like we've had situations in Napa and Davis and some other cities where literally the census got the external boundary of the city wrong. And we had to split blocks to make the set the outside boundary of the city correct. But generally within a city drawing districts, it's not a best practice to, to split those blocks because once you split a block, you really don't know uh, what the population is of that area, and it essentially is messing with the integrity of the data. Um, and with that, if there's other questions, maybe somebody can remind me. Mayor, do you remember any others? No, no that was very, very good. Okay, we have three hands up, so I'm going to give everybody Mayor, one. Th there, there was, there were two other, but one was Jake Caruso, and, and I think that this is, this is relevant, if I may. Um, he asked a question about... Um, linear corridors mm -hmm. and kind of the feasibility of district maps on linear corridors that in, in his mind may not represent a community of interest. I thought that that was a really thoughtful comment. Um, that really does speak to the kind of way that you need to be thinking about these districts, because I kind of mentioned that, you know, hey, we see a lot of these maps with these strips. Um, we've looked at some of your neighborhoods and it looks as though like Telescope Hills, you'll see as a long strip on some maps that you could look at online, but then the speaker mentioned, I think it was upper telescope and, and referencing that that might also itself have kind of two different sides to it, one in more of the hillside area and one in more of the urban area. Um, so uh, I thought that that was really thoughtful because there might be some blend where there might be some areas like around Mills Estates or something like that, where it makes sense to do more of a strip. And then there might be some areas where because of the urban nature of populations around the more dense portions of the city, that it makes sense to kind of block that strip nature and draw something a little bit, um, uh, you know, drawing in, in a different direction in order to make those districts effective. I thought that was, I thought that was a really smart comment. And so I don't want to, um, put my thumb on the scale too much to say that, aha, you should do these long strips. Um, I was just saying that sometimes when you see things like long strips, you can say, well, what's the rational basis for that? And some people might point to the nature of uh, some versions of neighborhood lines that you can find online. 
Uh, and to clarify, Paul, it's okay. Some people wanted to know if you could tell them why they were their map was disregarded. And, oh, sec yeah. and secondarily on the um, geographics, the linear part, I think some maps were drawn taking out Cappuccino High School, which is a big, like they, they drew around it kind of thing, which mm -hmm. is not, you know, a resident and the golf course. So I think some people thinking in their minds, they drew it that way because those things, unless you're registering the gophers to vote at the golf course, um, our people would take that out and kind of draw around it. So yeah, that makes well, sense. We need to help them with, or somehow with the formatting. Thank you. Yeah. We have, we have three speakers that haven't spoke. Each one of you get one minute, please, before we sum up the meeting. I'll start with Christopher, Christopher Del Negro. Chris. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, so I did submit a, a map. What was really important to me was <clears throat> that every district had a vested interest in some of the resources here in Millbrae, the anchor points, such as, for example, a park <clears throat> in each district, and to split the school districts, it, it, according to school districts, and so that each of the districts had an actual school, because those are very big anchor points in our community. Um, obviously, Taylor Central Park in our community center um, being at the center of the community, I kind of wanted to make sure that everybody had a vested interest in the center of the community, in the heart of our city, by having their district touch that community center in the middle. So I submitted a map that was really you know, around these sort of vested interests and anchor points for communities, and then dividing our, our communities up and trying to aggregate certain communities together that had common interests. Um, I did, of course, go online after the um, demographic um, materials were available and did some editing on it and submitted a second version that had the edited for demographics that got really close to the perfect um, divisions. Thank you, Chris. Council Member Mayor, Schneider. Mayor Leva, I excuse me, I think I had a couple of questions for you and or the city manager, please. Would you please address them? <clears throat> I'm sorry, Lou. I did not hear a question to me. And I had... I, specified two specific, very specific questions to you about why not take advantage of the opportunity. There were direct I think questions. I, answered them in, I think I answered them in email and Lou, I'm, I'm no, sorry. I did not get answers in email. Council member Schneider is, you're up and you, can you please, I'm sorry that it took so long to get to you, but can Mayor, you do something? Uh, in Mayor, I'd be, I'd be happy to just quickly for the, the public address Mr. Sandrini's question. When, if you're, I, I, this, this is the law. We, you can't negotiate or settle something individually with somebody and not, and, and, and violate the law. Um, so we did not have the opportunity to sit down and settle a case because we would still be in violation of the California Voters' Rights Act. The California Voters' Rights Act is not negotiable. And so there isn't anything to negotiate. Once it was identified, if one attorney identifies that the city uh, you know, may not be compliant. If we would settle and negotiate with that attorney, that doesn't mean a hundred other attorneys can't come knocking on our door saying that we're in violation of the law. So I, I think, I think Mr. Sandrini is a little bit misinformed, but we are working on a comprehensive response to him, but just for the benefit of the public, this is not negotiable. You can't negotiate a law differently with an attorney or, or a constituent. So um, the law is a law and there, there's, there's nothing to settle here. Thank you, city manager. Council member Schneider, it's your turn. And please, I mean, get out what you need to get on. I apologize for delaying this. Um, okay. Mr. Mitchell, a number of residents called me at trying to do their maps, trying to keep our east side together so that they will have a voice, but the population isn't there. However, the Gateway Project is gonna start moving people in possibly as early as the summer or September of this year. Those are 400 units adding at least 400 people to the area around the BART station. How can our residents know? I know you've said to us, we can't count that, but we know there are gonna be at least 400 new residents in Millbrae right there that might allow a better district, both for the east side, but for the people along the west side of, of El Camino who are being grabbed and sucked into district to that district. And then my second question, if it wasn't for Mr. Terezi, I wouldn't have been able to find the map that shows the better street delineations. Perhaps on our website, we can help our, our residents find 
the maps are very vague. You have to really open them and then try to figure out the streets unless you click on another box and then you get to a better map. So if we could provide more direction for our residents, I would appreciate that. Thank you, Council Member Schneider. So we need direction. And let's be clear, though, we cannot count on future developments, whether they're in near future or not. We cannot. Count Mayor, that. I don't think that's true, though. I think, well, I, I think this one is so close. I don't think it's between you and I. Maybe Paul can answer it. Yeah, I'm happy to answer it. And and trust me, this comes up a lot. Um, the state law is very specific. It doesn't give any wiggle room. The only thing we can use is the data set provided by the US Census Bureau after it's been adjusted by the statewide database to adjust for prison population. That's not to say that it's fair. So I wanna be clear about that. I'm not trying to endorse that this data set is going to provide the best outcomes for everybody. We're doing a redistricting in Butte County. Butte County, as you know, had horrible fires essentially destroying the city of Paradise. That's half of a supervisorial district in Paradise, 26,000 people in an area where, where, where supervisorial districts are 51,000 people. So uh, can this Butte County say, well, Paradise is rebuilding. Um, they've been growing thousands of people every year since the fires as they try to get back to some more sustainable population. The fact is you can't. Uh, by the time those lines go effect, in 2022, the data from that redistricting of April 1st, 2020 will be two years old. And that's two years of paradise trying to rebuild that are never going to be calculated in the census and won't be able to be used by Butte County until 2031. So there are instances, there are other areas that have still population existing, but there were fires that wiped out towns and there's literally nobody there anymore, yet they still have to use that population that's almost like you know, a figment of our imagination because it's from 10 years ago or from, from two years ago, um, even though that's, you know, even though we know there's no population there. So the only tool we have at our disposal is that small 10% buffer. We could say, well, this part of this district is already in an area that we know is growing in population. We believe we'll have future population growth. So we're going to make it on the 6% underside. And this district over here, we're going to make it 4% overpopulated because we know that when that population comes in, it will balance. But that rational basis for using your total plan deviation is still only a small adjustment um, and would have to be balanced with other rational bases for the deviation. So there is no you know, magic wand we can wave to say it's okay to have a 20% deviation in order to adjust for future population growth, unfortunately. Okay, I just want to tell you what I heard from that. I heard that within the, the deviation, knowing that we're going to have at least 400 people, knowing that we have to approve this map by March 1st, but by September it will already be different, we could err a little bit there and have better balances by the time we have the 2022 election. And I would only say Councilman Holabra, I know he is hopefully working with um, our assemblymen on changing CVRA. The examples that you gave us in the burned areas show another point of why this law is so ridiculous. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, last comment, Council Member Holliber, and please could you make it uh, a minute so we can get on to the uh, regular council meeting? Well, do, I thought, I thought we were supposed to give our input. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I I'll, apologize. I'll I, I apologize, Ruben. Yeah. Um, okay, thank you for uh, pre presenting these maps and for everyone from the public who has um, provided maps with the mapping tool. Um, I do actually really like the plan D that was submitted that was, I think, based off of um, Commissioner Del, Del Negro's map. I, I like how it does integrate neighborhoods on both the east and west side um, of El Camino um, together um, and uses Central Park kind of as that uh, Central Hub. Um, you know, I know the deviation is relatively high, so perhaps there could be a little bit of balancing done if that map were to be were to move forward on that map. Um, and I think the other option that I like was Map C that had been presented at the previous uh, council meeting. Um, but I, but I did also notice I played around a little bit with the mapping tool that there were some um, issues with the census blocks that. You know, for example, as mentioned around the, the golf course, and there's the other areas where 
Um, there were a, a few census blocks that were all an enclave within an, an other census block. Oh yeah. Um, so I, I think that was around the Marina Vista neighborhood that it was difficult to do much there without encompassing a much larger census block. So perhaps as we do finalize this maps, we could look a little bit more closely because I don't think they're necessarily adding people to, to those areas. It's more of a geographic area of open space than circles um, neighborhoods um, to make minor technical adjustments um, as needed. Um, so those are all the comments that I have uh, for this evening. Thank you. Great comments. Thank you very much. With that being said, I'd like to adjourn this special meeting and move on to our regular council meeting, which requires a separate Zoom link. So council members and public, if you'd like to join us, please be prompt. Madam Mayor, if I may, um, actually, it's the same link. Um, yeah. We would like to ask maybe a minute or two uh, so MCTV can uh, you know, start and stop the, the video. Beautiful. Ma Madam, Madam Mayor, I just wondered, as a matter of process and for all the interested members of the public, and thank you for participating, um, whether the city manager might want to make clear where, where we're probably headed with this, because uh, it, it seems that, that uh, we didn't quite get through perhaps um, uh, the kind of discussion that we would have liked to have at the council level and we're rushing at the end. Um, I, city manager, please uh, clarify if you will. I, I, I think our intention is to bring this matter back to your February 8th council meeting uh, to allow a more fulsome discussion and hopefully pinpoint you know, kind of final direction to our consultants um, as to what a final map may be for the city of Milbury. Um, Tom? What yeah, uh, th what you thank you. Uh, thank you to our city attorney. Yeah, we did, um, you know, in our schedule, you know, to get to that uh, February 22nd or no, no later than March 1st adoption, <laughs> uh, we did have a little bit of um, um, float in our schedule. So we, we can do one of two things. We, we, I, and I do think this necessitates another, another meeting for sure. Um, use our regularly scheduled meeting of February 8th. Um, <clears throat> we only, you know, can plan on having just a few housekeeping items and dedicate that meeting to this issue. Uh, or if the council desires, we could have a special meeting of the city council just dedicated, you know, to this. My recommendation would be let's have it on February 8th um, and we can pretty much clear that agenda uh, to be a, a relatively light agenda so we can have a significant amount of time on, on this particular issue. Do we need a motion for that? Well, uh, just I, I direction? Just, just concurrence, think, Mayor? Yeah, direction. I don't think we need a formal motion, but that, that really would be the staff recommendation. And I thought we should clarify that for all of these. Um, yeah, every, everybody will have some some time. And, and actually, this will be good because it gave us a lot of thought. So if we bring yes. it forward, forward the, uh, to the February 8th meeting, would everybody on the council be okay with that? Especially those that I had to cut off? <laughs> yeah, right. Council Member yes. Schneider, are you okay with that? Council Member yeah. Holliber, Council Member Fung didn't even speak. I didn't speak. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yes, please. That's our plan. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay, so now we will adjourn this meeting and we'll take five minutes. It's 713. We'll take five minutes and come back uh, to our regularly scheduled council meeting. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. Thank, Thank you, you very much.